Hello and welcome once again to Cultural Caravan. I'm your host, Ed Werner, for this series. And today we're going to start a little different type of series on Cultural Caravan. Cultural Caravan, as you may recall, or for you, those of you who are new to our program, is a series of programs we've been doing on different aspects of Kenosha. For example, in past programs, we've done the making of a totem pole. We've done a tour through St. Matthew's Episcopal Church, and we've even taped the children's Christmas party at the Danish Brotherhood here in Kenosha. So it's a kind of a cultural thing we're doing. What we're going to do this time is take on a big project, and that is we're going to have a mine series, broken the mine, and we're going to cover the history of Kenosha and Kenosha County from 1828 to 1943. I'm sure you'll agree that's a pretty big project. And just doing with slides and mine half our episodes, we can't cover everything. There are books, of course, on the history of Kenosha that you can read, pictorial, some of them, and some of them a lot of heavy reading. What we're going to do is use slides. The program is slated towards a wide variety in our audience. For example, in the third to fifth grade, students at the elementary level learn the history of Kenosha. I've been fortunate personally to partake in some of that as a historian of the lighthouse. But other phases of the children's education is going to various museums and studying how Kenosha actually started. Middle school, high school, and college students, I think, will find this series of programs interesting in the fact that it'll give them an idea of different facets that they could write papers on. And of course, to my old friends in the audience, senior citizens, you could relive a little bit of the old days, bring up some of the past, and remember, remember some of the buildings that you'll see. Of course, not in 1828 or 1842. So we have to be a little realistic. Another group I'd like to invite to watch this program are the new members that are coming into the Kenosha, Kenosha County community. This would be a nice way for you on a very easy evening program, for example, to learn about this new community that you've joined, Kenosha or Kenosha County. So I think you'll find it interesting. Of particular interest to the old timers, I think you'll find that prior to 1927, Kenosha had a street system by names. 1927, it was shifted over to the grid system and numbers were used. So in the early part of this program, you'll be hearing us relate to different street names, but then in parentheses, more or less, we'll tell you the up-to-date street names or numbers for the newer members. For example, if I said, in 1909, meet me at the corner of Howland Avenue and Elizabeth Street, if you weren't around before 1927, you would have to know that it was 22nd Avenue and 63rd Street, which really means that I would probably be meeting you to go to the Danish Brotherhood building. Now, as I mentioned, we can't have the whole history of Kenosha in nine our segments. By a fortunate circumstance, Dr. John Hosmatic, who's the archivist of the Unified School System, was browsing through his area over there, and he came across 247 slides. These slides were made by Phil Sander of the Kenosha County Historical Society, and a copy was given to the Unified School System. This series of slides is what we are using for this program. 
Now, not all of the slides were in good enough condition or directly related to Kenosha, Kenosha County, so we had to put them aside. So this series will be designed for basically uh, 225 slides. So we're going to have the whole range of Kenosha, Kenosha County. We did the program in chronological order by dates. That is as best we could. For example, uh, we may have a picture of uh, Mr. Simmons, Alman Simmons, uh, who came to Kenosha in the early 1800s, but we didn't get his picture maybe till the 1864, his wife maybe a little later, and then maybe in 1876, 1878, we got a photograph of his home. So we had to jump out of context a little bit to make the story a little more continuous. You'll see that. But by and large, we're going to try to stick with the dates. The other thing that really made this program possible was the fact that Mr. Dewey, who originally collected the photographs from glass plates, also wrote a narration of each of the slides. Now you can imagine the tremendous amount of historical research it takes to put all that together and narrate each slide. Dr. Hosmatic and I have taken those three volumes and we put it down into this one volume for this particular program. Mainly what we had to do was to put everything in past tense. Because for the most part, Mr. Dewey, who was really responsible for this program, these slides are from the collection of Mr. Dewey, who had a collection of 1,200 of these photographs. These 247 are part of that 1,200 collection, which is at the Historical Society. Mr. Dewey did most of his narration during the 1930s. So to us, that's pretty much past tense. But thank heavens, he actually did it. It would be a shame to lose this type of history. With the facilities we have today, we are very happy to bring you this program. But before we start the program, I'd like to have you meet Mr. Cortland Dewey, who is really responsible for this program. Cortland Ernest Dewey. Cortland Ernest Dewey was born March 21, 1861 in Paris Township. At age seven, he moved to Kenosha with his parents. At 17, he joined his father in the hardware business and remained in that work for about 60 years. He was an active volunteer fireman with the Jem Hose Company, a charter member of the Elks Club and a member of the Congregational Men's Club and Church. He served in the Wisconsin State Assembly in 1929 and 1930, and as president of the Kenosha County Historical Society from 1933 to his death, February 14, 1945. He also helped organize the Hardware Mutual Insurance Companies. Mr. Dewey developed a collection of 1,256 slides depicting the growth and history of Kenosha County. This series of Kenosha slides are from his collection. Walk in the Water, the first steamboat. The launching of the first steamer named Walk in the Water at Black Rock near Buffalo in 1818 was heralded to the world as a new beginning in lake navigation. Similarly, Fulton's contemporary steamboat was heralded as a revolution in river commerce. This was the first lake steamer known to Wisconsin waters and was earlier in its arrival upon Wisconsin shores than any Mississippi River steamboat. She was the first of a long line of steamers that later sailed the waters off Kenosha. This photo shows E.G. Ozan pointing to the site of Jacob Montgomery's log cabin. The site is on Green Bay Road, just north of the intersection with Petrifying Springs Road in Summers, adjoining Petrifying Springs Park. On March 4, 1828, Jacob Montgomery, a trapper with his two sons, built a log cabin on this site on the banks of the Pike River, near the home of E.G. Ozan. This was on March 4, 1828. 
five years before the Indians were forced out of this area. When the founders of the settlement of Pike, now Kenosha, crossed over to the head of the Pike River on their search for a place to establish a settlement, they found Jacob Montgomery and his sons already occupying a log cabin. This cabin seems to have been the first in our county. Mr. Montgomery remained there eight years or more and was somewhat famous among the pioneers as a hunter. He then moved west and disappeared from our history. So the honor of the first settlement in Kenosha County belongs to Jacob Montgomery in the town of Summers. The Maxwell House, located on Green Bay Road at what is now Highway 31 and 60th Street, as it appeared in 1836. In 1836, a weekly stage began to run between Chicago and Milwaukee over the Green Bay Trail. The first post office was established in Pike at the George Willis Tavern, later known as the Maxwell House, in what is now Summers Township. This office also served Southport until 1840. The mailman, known as Uncle Billy Smith, carried the mail by horseback over the Green Bay Trail from Southport to Milwaukee. A toll gate on the east-west plank road was also located at this intersection. A story is told that during these years, Mr. Harvey Durkee would drive out to the old tavern to meet the Chicago and Milwaukee stage and bring back the Kenosha mail in his hat. This is General John Bullen. Mr. Bullen came to Kenosha County, Salem Township, in the year 1836 and located at the place known as Bullen's Bridge. He was active and influential in labors for his town and county and was appointed a general of the militia by Governor Dodge. He died in Kenosha August 15, 1850 and is buried in the Green Ridge Cemetery. During the summer of 1836, General John Bullen built on the bank of the Fox River a two-story house, 18 by 22 feet, constructed almost entirely of homemade lumber from the neighboring forests. The timbers were hewn and floor planks, shingles, and siding were split or ribbed and shaved by hand. A year or two later, this house was enlarged and a sign was hung on a nearby tree bearing the legend Salem House. It was also called Bullen's Tavern. The price for supper, breakfast, lodging, and two horses to hay was from 50 cents to 62 and a half cents, probably called four or five shillings. Mr. Bullen, almost entirely from his own means, built across the Fox River a substantial bridge. This was the first bridge between Dundee and Burlington and was called Bullen's Bridge. In 1847, he constructed the National Hotel in Kenosha. General John Bullen was the father of another noted Kenoshan, John Bullen, Jr. This is the grave marker of General John Bullen. The grave of General John Bullen is located about midway between Sheridan Road and 7th Avenue in the extreme north part of the Green Ridge Cemetery. The markings on his gravestone indicate that General Bullen was born on May 19, 1783 and died August 15, 1850 at the age of 67 years, 2 months, and 26 days. The flag holding star signifies that he participated in the War of 1812. John Bullen Jr., the son of General John Bullen, was born May 19, 1803. He died on May 9, 1884, at the age of 81 years in Elba, Minnesota. He located at Pike Creek on June 12, 1835, and was noted as one of the founders of the community that is now Kenosha. The John Bullen home in 1835 was a small log building with a bark-covered roof located on the north side of Pike Creek near the Main Street or 6th Avenue Bridge. Mr. Bullen attained a good deal of prominence as an extensive operator in commercial enterprises. He was a man of great wealth, but the crash of 1857 seriously embarrassed him and he moved to Winona County, Minnesota, where he engaged in merchandising and farming. 
He was a leading member of the Masonic fraternity in Wisconsin. After his death, his remains were brought back to Kenosha and he was buried in Green Ridge Cemetery. This log house was the first home of John McCoy, who came to Wisconsin from the state of New York in 1846. It was located at Benham's Corners, now Liberty Corners, in the township of Salem, just west of the Little Congregational Church. John McCoy came to Wisconsin with his family in company with his brother Samuel. This cabin was built after they arrived and the family lived with relatives until its completion. The log cabin was destroyed about uh, 1930. Reuben H. Deming came to the village of Pike Creek October 25, 1836. He was born in Bennington, Vermont on September 15, 1798, and he died in Kenosha on February 9, 1867. For a time he was employed in mercantile affairs, but soon took a prominent part in public matters relating to the welfare and prosperity of the community. His early labors in a cause of freedom, temperance, and education have identified him with the history and progress of Southport. He had a major influence as he labored for the establishment and support of the local public schools. He was one of the first to favor the organization of free schools. Mr. Deming was a Methodist minister and a justice of the peace. This was the home of Reuben H. Deming in 1858. The Deming home was located on Kenosha Street near Deming Street, that is 7th Avenue and 61st Street. The Reverend Deming, along with other prominent citizens of Kenosha or Southport, was set to operate an underground railroad station in his home. The Underground Railroad was a name given to an unorganized body of men who assisted slaves to escape to Canada. Many of the runaway slaves were routed through Southport after crossing the Ohio River into Illinois. Kenosha or Southport and other Lake Michigan ports were sought as junction points because here could be secured passage by boat. When stopping at these stations, the slaves were concealed in attics, barns, or other places until after dark after which they proceeded to the next stop. This is the Pike Creek Beacon Light in 1836. This drawing was made in an attempt to visualize the description of the first beacon light in the village of Pike Creek in 1836. For the convenience of navigation on Lake Michigan, it was found necessary to have some type of beacon, a primitive lighthouse at Pike Creek. To supply this need, a large oak tree on the bank of the lake, some 12 rods south of the present harbor, was cut down so as to leave a stump 10 feet high. On top of this stump was put a layer of stones. On this foundation, a fire of wood was kindled every evening at sundown during the season of navigation. Several citizens of the place volunteered to perform the duty of lighthouse keeper, alternately one week each. This beacon light served until the year 1840 when an improved lighthouse was built. This is the home of Henry Williams. This home was built about 1836 or 1837. A story is told that Mrs. Williams, as soon as the winter of 1836 or 37 was over, went to look over the family claim to select the site for their permanent home. At this site then, Mrs. Williams planted a small lilac bush part of which she had brought from Lincoln, England in 1825. Although the log cabin the family lived in had barely been completed, plans were made to build a house on the selected site. A friend of Mr. Jerome boasted that he could build or lay a cellar wall vermin proof that would last a lifetime and without using any mortar. It proved to be a success and was still in use in 1935. On June 8, 1835, a baby girl was born in the new house. However, the happiness of having the new baby turned to sorrow, as on June 16, Mrs. Williams passed away. By request, she was buried under the lilac bush she had so dearly loved. A neighbor, Mrs. Holland, took the baby to her home until Mr. Williams could take charge. The baby, named Maria, proved to be the first white child born to live in Southport.
This is a map of downtown Southport as it appeared about 1838. The boundaries of the town at that time were as follows. On the north, Washington Road. The south boundary was 60th Street. The east boundary, of course, was Lake Michigan. In the west boundary, uh, the elevated tracks of the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad. Note the following points. Main Street is a dead end at South Street, or 59th Street. Uh, note the layout of Exchange Street, uh, Fifth Avenue. And note the location of the bridge over Pike Creek. Now, Pike Creek to the west of Washington Island is actually the Pike River. John Dexter was an early settler of Pleasant Prairie. The original of this slide was a daguerreotype taken about 1839. John Dexter was the fourth child of Samuel Dexter and Candace Windsor. He was born at Stratford, Connecticut in January of 1783. He left Stratford at the age of 14 with his parents and in 1836 joined the general migration to the west, settling in Pleasant Prairie. He bought a thousand acres of land, paying a dollar and 25 cents an acre. On his arrival, he built three log houses in one of which he lived, and the other two were occupied by a son and daughter with their families. This is the John Dexter home built in 1842. It is said to be the first brick house built between Chicago and Milwaukee on the Green Bay Road. It was located one half mile north of the Wisconsin-Illinois state line. The house had been increased in size as the membership of the family demanded. It was widely known throughout this part of Wisconsin and northern Illinois as a hospitable place for the entertainment of travelers, and in the early days it was a favorite stopping place. The house was destroyed by fire on October 2nd, 1909. This is the oldest Methodist church in Wisconsin, located in Summers and Kellogg's Corners. In 1837, the Kellogg family removed from Connecticut and settled at what became Kellogg's Corner in the town of Pike, later Summers. The Kellogg family consisted of three brothers and their respective families. They were Chauncey, Seth, and Thaddeus. They were part of a large family, most of whom were influential and useful members of the Methodist Episcopal Church. On the first Sabbath, after the three families became settled, they met in one of the rude shanties just completed and held a prayer meeting and Sunday school. The result of this first prayer meeting in 1837 was the establishment of the Methodist Church completed in 1840. It was the first Methodist Church not only in the township but also in the state. The timbers were hand-hewn out of solid oak and when in 1913 or 1914 the building was sold and taken down, the timbers were in a splendid state of preservation and were used in the building of a barn. The name Southport was given to the settlement later known as Kenosha in the spring of 1837. Prior to that, it was known as Pike Creek. Until 1839, the businesses were confined to a district near the lake between Market Street, that is 56th Street, and the present mouth of the harbor. In that year, 1839, nearly all the businesses went over to the north side. The north side maintained its shore until about 1841, when the tide again turned and nearly everything went again to the south. This ox cart was brought from New Haven, Connecticut in 1840 by Solomon Upson. It was used for nearly 40 years on the Upson farm in the town of Bristol in Kenosha County. This was a new Southport beacon light. By 1840, the harbor had been defined and a better beacon light was necessary at the harbor area. So an improved beacon was constructed to replace the tree stump beacon. The new beacon light consisted of four posts 24 feet high on the top of which was placed a lantern room, three feet square. The structure was built by subscription at a cost of $60, most of the funds being raised by Mr. J.M. Stryker. The light was tended by the citizens of Southport. 
This slide shows the population growth statistics of early Southport from its founding as Pike Creek in 1835 until 1840. Kenosha was on the grow even back then. Wilmot's first schoolhouse, sometime in the late 1840s, was located on the northwest corner of Pearl and Benham Streets. It was a one-story frame building with two large rooms or departments with accommodations for 200 scholars. It remained a schoolhouse at this location for many years. It was later removed to the southwest corner of Main and Water Streets and was then used as a blacksmith shop. This is the first Catholic church in Kenosha. The first uh, Catholic clergyman who visited here was Reverend James O'Kelly in July of 1839. In June of 1841, the Reverend Florentine J. Bonduel came from Green Bay and he founded a congregation. Not long after the congregation was organized, a small building was fitted up on Chicago and Wisconsin streets, that's 8th Avenue and 58th Street, for church purposes. The original size of the church was 20 by 30 feet, one story high, on a low foundation. Windows were protected by outside blinds and at one time lightning rods adorned the roof. Many of the timbers and boards were of black walnut and oak. The timbers were fastened with mortise joints and dowel pins. On the west side was a row of seven locust trees. Later, the church became a private residence. Father Florentine J. Bonjul organized the first Catholic church in Southport or Kenosha in 1841. He was a Belgian missionary who came to Wisconsin in 1837 and celebrated mass at Solomon Juno's house in Milwaukee in August of that year. He was a missionary at Lake Poygan in 1843 and at Prairie Duchene in 1844 through 46. In 1852, he was a missionary among the Menominee Indians. He died on December 13, 1861, at Green Bay. This completes our first episode of Cultural Caravan in the history of Kenosha and Kenosha County. We're into 1842 now, and I hope you've seen some interesting slides and picked up some good information. There's been a lot of confusion between Pike Creek, Pike River, Pike, and Southport. We hope to clear that up in episode two. So I hope you'll join us for episode two of the history of Kenosha and Kenosha County. This is your host, Ed Werner. Thank you for viewing, and see you next time.